Good afternoon, everyone. We are expecting a lot of you today, so we'll just uh, wait for everybody to come in. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a very exciting program for you all, which I'm sure would be of interest to, to everyone. And we want it to be very interactive. So please, you can already see the Q&A box and the chat feature is also fully enabled. So please do give your questions, ask a lot of questions and uh, already think about the, the collaboration and uh, the proposals that we're going to submit. So we're, I'm still uh, looking and there's still a lot of you trickling in. So a few seconds. Okay. All right. Yes, please uh, send your uh, greetings in the chat. Let us know uh, who you are, where you come from. And uh, yeah, a lot of people from different countries. So welcome, welcome. All right. Okay, so let's start. My name is Jenny Almako. I come from uh, Euraxis. This is my colleague, Dr. Susana Renzo Vasu, also regional coordinator of Euraxis. I'll also put in here, and I hope they don't mind, we have our colleagues from the ASEAN uh, Secretariat, uh, Ms. Vani and Ms. Rizki. Uh, this is actually a, a joint uh, program together with the ASEAN Secretariat, uh, DGRTD of the European uh, Commission and of course with your access. And we welcome you to the general info sessions, the first of a series. And this uh, today we will be talking about international collaboration in Horizon Europe. So this is not the first, and it's very important to say that because we want to have you also for the succeeding ones. This is the general info session, and we hope that it inspires you to continue to attend for the succeeding, uh, succeeding uh, sessions as well. So this is uh, our way of promoting ASEAN participation in Horizon Europe with information, training, and matchmaking uh, sessions. So if you've encountered us for the first time, Susanna and I, I would like to give the, the room now to Susanna to talk a little bit about your access before we start. Well, thank you so much, Jenny. I'm just quickly gonna share my screen just to say a few words about the project that Jenny and I are representing here in Southeast Asia. As Jenny has said, we are both part of the Euraxis Worldwide Project, and that is a global network of researchers, innovators, and entrepreneurs. And you can see here, it's a community that unites 43 European countries and nine worldwide hubs, including Southeast Asia, but you can see at the top of the screen, the map, and we're really trying to bring researchers together. Our mandate is to facilitate international collaboration and mobility between Europe and the world. We have an online portal, the Euraxis portal, which really is a comprehensive toolkit for anyone who's interested in either working with European collaborators or spending some part of their research career in Europe. You find there a whole host of information about the research landscape in Europe, about the opportunities in terms of funding, but also career development that is available. We have uh, plenty of networking opportunities if you're trying to expand your uh, network of international collaborators. And of course, it is a community. We have currently just under 30,000 researchers who are part of Euraxis here in Southeast Asia. And you can see here just a quick list of the activities that we are organizing for you. Matchmaking sessions are particularly interesting, I think, to lots of researchers who are trying to enter collaborations with the European partners. We have various information sessions, but also scientific staff exchanges. I have here on the right hand side a QR code and uh, I invite you just perhaps scan it and that will lead you to our website and you'll always be up to date on the various activities that Jenny and I are organizing. That's it for me and I'll hand over to Jenny again. Thank you so much for that, Susanna. So whether you are looking for insights into European research policy uh, funding uh, programs, uh, or perhaps uh, practical tips to pursue a scientific career in Europe, or you want to build contacts and meet 
researchers. So your access worldwide is there for you. The event that we have today, and again, we welcome everyone here. We are, there are still a lot of people trickling in. Uh, this is implemented by your access ASEAN with the support of the European Commission Directorate General for Research and Innovation and the Science and Technology Division of the ASEAN Secretariat. And now to formally welcome us to this event, we are very honored uh, to have the remarks coming from His Excellency Muhammad Nasri Muhammad Yusuf, the chair of the ASEAN POSTI 2023, and he is also permanent secretary of the Ministry of Transport and Info Communications of Brunei Darussalam. His Excellency, Mr. Igor Dresman, UN President to ASEAN, Ms. Nanka Huisman, Head of Unit, International Cooperation Policy, Director General for Research and Innovation, European Commission. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to the Euroaccess ASEAN with the support of the European Commission hosting the general info session, International Collaboration in Horizon Europe. It is indeed my honor to speak here today at the opening ceremony. It is also my pleasure to be in the company of universities, research institutions, industry actors, and others from the public and the private sector across ASEAN and the European research area. As strategic partners, ASEAN and the EU have been in the long standing dynamic and broad-based relationship under the plan of action to implement the ASEAN-EU strategic partnership 2023-2027, the EU and ASEAN have committed to enhancing cooperation on research and innovation, science and technology, particularly via the ASEAN-European dialogue on science and technology, to strengthen the partnership between the two regions and promote sustainable economic growth and development through scientific and technological collaboration. Further, both regions aim to continue cooperation in promoting the findings of the midterm review in the implementation of the ASEAN Plan of Action on Science, Technology and Innovation, APASTI 2016 to 2025, as a building block for ASEAN EU Science, Technology and Innovation cooperation and work closely with ASEAN Committee on Science, Technology and Innovation, COSTI. High performance computing, green tech, space dialogue, technology management hub, and talent mobility are examples of strong support of the EU to ASEAN STI. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we really appreciate that your access ASEAN with support from the EU delegation in ASEAN and the ASEAN Secretariat launched Horizon Europe in Southeast Asia in June 2021 with a series of info sessions, best practices, curated calls for the ASEAN STI community and matchmaking sessions. This event is part and parcel of the project, promoting ASEAN participation in Horizon Europe series of information training and matchmaking sessions with selected thematic subcommittee of the ASEAN Committee on Science, Technology and Innovation, COSTI, implemented by your access ASEAN with the support of the European Commission, Director General for Research and Innovation, DGRTD, and the Science and Technology Division of the ASEAN Secretariat. The workshop aims to encourage the participation of ASEAN institutions and entities in the pillar two calls of the Horizon Europe program. The ASEAN region presents a wealth of opportunities for collaboration in research and innovation. And the pillar two calls focus on global challenges and industrial competitiveness, which are of great relevance to our region. The Horizon Europe workshop provides a unique opportunity to showcase the opportunities available and offer guidance on how best to access them. We hope that this year's activities will be able to create a network of Horizon that Europe knowledge brokers involving core contacts within the ASEAN COSTI to become partners in the continuous promotion and facilitation of EU-ASEAN collaboration 
in research and innovation. Furthermore, alignment with the EU ASEAN Plan of Action, priorities of DGRT and other DGRTD instruments, most notably the Southeast Asia EU Joint Funding Scheme can be achieved. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, in an era where we are challenged with post-pandemic recovery, efforts and climate change, our common interests should be positioned in fostering peace and sustainable development. Through such close cooperation, I'm confident that ASEAN and the EU can address our challenges together. I'm confident the Horizon Europe series of information, training and matchmaking sessions with selected thematic subcommittees of the ASEAN COSTI would be an important step towards the advancement of STI in ASEAN and EU through the creation and expansion of a strong network of Horizon Europe knowledge brokers. Expanding our networks is a small part, yet important step towards creating a collaborative environment that allows innovation to thrive in both our regions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for your support uh, to this program and, of course, to, to the whole of COSTI as well for their support. Uh, Horizon Europe, uh, the research and innovation funding program, is one of the main tools to implement Europe's uh, strategy for international cooperation. Uh, the global approach to research and innovation. So it is only fitting that we have with us the head of unit of the International Cooperation Policy in the European Commission Directorate General for Research and Innovation, Ms. Minke Busman. Minke, thank you so much uh, for joining us today and uh, for gracing us with your presence. We know you're extremely busy. Thank you for your support and the room is yours. Many thanks, um, Jenny, for giving me the floor and good morning, good afternoon to uh, all of you connected. I see uh, there are uh, really many, so that's uh, always very, very encouraging. First of all, uh, many thanks, Excellency Minister uh, Mohamed Natsi, Mohamed Youssef, uh, Chair of the ASEAN COSTI um, 23 and Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Transport and Info Communications of Brunei. Brunei. Dura Salam. Many thanks, Excellency, for um, joining us uh, in this event uh, today to giving uh, the importance uh, to it, uh, as you have done um, in, in your opening remarks. Um, I am based in Brussels, so greetings from Brussels also at the same time, where it is still uh, early morning. And finally, thank you very much to your access to Jenny and to Suzanne. Uh, for the organization of this uh, of this event that is bringing so many uh, of us together uh, this morning and after. Um, as highlighted by the minister already, um, the EU ASEAN commemorative uh, summit that we held in December last year underlined indeed that it is key uh, that we work together towards uh, encouraging stronger research links between the ASEAN uh, region and the EU. Uh, and in this, uh, in this summit, leaders committed to deepening our collaboration in science, technology, and innovation. Uh, we believe that these uh, political commitments are very timely, as researchers and innovators are, are vital, are key for our capacity to address the global challenges uh, we are faced with. And we, of course, need international cooperation to, uh, to develop together innovative solutions uh, towards delivering the green and digital transitions for addressing, for example, challenges to global health, biodiversity issues, um, and creating a sustainable future. Uh, at the summit, we, uh, as the minister also indicated, adopted a plan of action in which we set out uh, together our priorities and wishes for uh, the future. This plan of action highlights a focus on green technologies, space and marine areas, as uh, the priorities for cooperation in the field of research and innovation. Um, and Jenny already referred to the EU's strategy for uh, international cooperation in RNI, which we call the global approach. Uh, this strategy, um, like uh, the, uh, the plan of action adopted last year, uh, sets out also a focus on international mobilization of researchers indicating that this is really crucial uh, to the well-being of citizens and future ge uh, generations. So working together 
with international uh, partners, we believe, uh, to promote good research and, and universal scientific values is really uh, key to achieve, uh, achieve the best uh, possible results. So it is uh, EU's new strategy in international cooperation on RNI sets out a focus on openness in international RNI cooperation, underlined by uh, alignment in RNI values and principles, such as, for example, academic, academic freedom or open science, ethics and integrity within um, research. And but at the same time, also the creation of a level playing field and reciprocity in the cooperation where needed. So in other words, we really are looking at a, at a balance and a nuanced approach in international RNI cooperation. Within this strategy, the ASEAN region is one of the priority reg uh, regions that we will uh, be working with in, in the next uh, few years. So let me now turn a bit towards the implementation, uh, where I have highlighted the different goals and priorities and strategies that um, we uh, created and agreed on in the last uh, few months. Um, so we are aiming to mobilize several instruments towards implementation. We have, of course, Horizon Europe Framework Program, the really the, the focus of today's event, but also uh, the Global Gateway, uh, as well as uh, a funding scheme, the Joint EU ASEAN Funding Scheme that some of you probably are very uh, familiar with. So firstly, uh, Horizon Europe, which is indeed the EU's uh, flagship program for research and innovation. Uh, it's entirely open to the world. So it allows uh, for researchers from all over the world to do collaborative research uh, together, uh, but also to engage in mobility uh, programs such as the Marie Curie um, actions. Um, in the next uh, few years, this, this program will continue to come up with uh, work programs and calls in which uh, researchers and innovators from the ASEAN region can engage together with those uh, from Europe. Secondly, uh, the Global Gateway. Uh, it also has uh, the RNI um, area as a priority investment area in the strategy, uh, but this uh, has a stronger focus on research infrastructures and a capacity building in science, technology, innovation, whereas the Horizon Europe program really focuses on uh, collaborative research and mobility uh, programs. An investment package of 10 billion euros of investment in the ASEAN region was announced at the summit uh, last year, and some of this money uh, will indeed go to the STI fields. And finally, we are preparing uh, the second phase of the joint EU ASEAN funding scheme allowing uh, those countries that want to join forces from both sides to, uh, to launch jointly funded research projects through joint calls uh, for proposals, again, in the priority areas uh, that we identified together uh, towards the green and digital uh, transition. Um, in, in October this year, uh, we will be, be holding the 11th EU ASEAN a Dialogue on Science and Technology in the, in the Philippines. And this will bring together, uh, on one hand, the European Commission, the ASEAN Secretariat, and, and the different member states to take stock of where we are in the cooperation, uh, where we are, where are we in terms of implementing uh, our priorities, but also uh, to agree on next steps. So you see, it really is a package of strategy, implementation, and uh, a certain governance framework allowing us to take stock of where we are and where we want to go. Uh, so to, to finalize, I, I really we really hope uh, on the side of the European Commission, DG Research and Innovation, that this seri series of information sessions um, can help us to further promote uh, the mutually beneficial scientific cooperation, will, which will uh, be required for all of us to address the shared global challenges uh, together. And that these kind of um, events information sessions are really useful uh, for, for, yeah, for those of you who want to engage in, uh, in this collaboration. So again, very happy to see so many participants connected um, this morning, this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, um, uh, those of you interested in learning more about the opportunities that the uh, European Union's Research and Innovation Program Horizon Europe provides, and we also, of course, very much hope that this, that this will lead to 
uh, more successful collaborative research between the EU and ASEAN researchers in the future. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a very pleasant uh, event today. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Ms. Ninke Guzman, the head of unit of, for international cooperation policy uh, in the European Commission, Directorate General for Research and Innovation. So thank you so much. You've given us a lot of, of information as well on the many things that Europe is doing in research and innovation. And again, the, the message is that it's open to the world and it's certainly open to Southeast Asia. So we hope that the series of sessions that we're gonna have uh, inspires you and encourages you to, to become part of it. So thank you so much, uh, Nike Guzman, for, for joining us. And with that, we will start uh, with our uh, with the, the experts that we're here we have. And I will put all of them here before uh, they give their presentations one, uh, one by one so that I can introduce them uh, properly. Hold on. We have one. We we have two and we have three. So we have this uh, these experts uh, joining us uh, from different parts uh, of Europe and I will introduce them and I will let you know what they're gonna uh, talk about. So it's a little bit of a signposting as well. So you know what to expect in the, the next hour or so. So uh, let's start with Michele Imaldi. He is a Horizon Europe expert uh, from Technalia. Uh, and uh, what we can expect from Michele is he will give us a general introduction to Horizon Europe, specific to Pillar 2, the program structure, uh, the participation modalities, you know, how do third countries, you know, participate uh, in the calls. He will also uh, try to discuss to us about the types of opportunities and uh, how to identify calls that are open for international cooperation. So Mikkel, thank you so much for joining us today. And our next speaker is uh, joining us from France, by the way, um, Mikkel is joining us from Spain. And uh, our next speaker, Antoine Kiefer, is joining us from France, from Paris. And um, so after the general introduction from, from Mikkel telling us how to participate, um, Antoine will zero in on introducing uh, cluster six. So one of the clusters under Horizon uh, Europe uh, pillar two, which is on food, bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture, and the environment. And uh, Antoine is actually also a part, he is the national coordinator for this cluster, and he's part of the French Ministry, ministry of Higher Education, Research, and Innovation. So Antoine, thank you so much for joining us today. And our next speaker, because we want you to know about best practices and successful proposals, you know, that have already third country participation. And he has uh, been a part of not one or not two, but several successful successful proposals, you know, under Horizon Europe and also the predecessor Horizon 2020. He will give us examples of, of these proposals that have had partners from Southeast Asia. And he is, Georg Melzer Venturi he is a manager of UTEMA. Sorry if I'm not mispronouncing that, uh, Georg, uh, research services, and he will tell us uh, a glimpse of that. So thank you so much uh, to you all uh, for joining us. And now I will give the room to Mikkel to start this discussion. Thank you, Mikkel. The room is yours. Okay, thank you very much. And good afternoon, everybody. I hope this is okay. Great. Okay, so uh, Horizon Europe is the, the European Research and Innovation Framework Program for the period 2021 to 2027. In fact, uh, this is the ninth uh, framework program to date, uh, following the previous eight. Uh, as you will see in this uh, well, slide, uh, the budget dedicated to, to research and innovation by the European Commission has been increasing continuously. Uh, the current budget is 95,000 million euros, which is a significant amo amount of money for seven years. And in fact, the increase from Horizon 2020, which is the eighth uh, is significant, especially taking into account that the UK is not in the in the European Union any longer. 
why the UK was the was the number number two well, participant in the in the program in the previous program. So I mean, it's a significant increase. Something that uh, must be mentioned is that the Horizon Europe is a program for research, of course, but not for research for research, the, or to increase the knowledge of humankind. This is research for a purpose. It's research with the clear orientation to solve some kind of a societal problem somewhere so that uh, it is re oriented research, if you wish. Uh, the program is divided in three pillars or three parts. Uh, pillar one is the closer, I mean, the more academic uh, part. Uh, I will not talk much, I, mean, I will not be talking on pillar one because uh, your access ASEAN has been disseminating pillar one widely so and in fact there, there are further seminars every every next month and so on so i will concentrate in pillar two which uh, in fact is the largest part of the program it is uh, the budget for pillar two is uh, 56 percent of the of the total budget so it's a very significant uh, part of the program pillar two itself is divided in what is called clusters, is six clusters the, from health, culture, digital, industry and space, climate energy, and cluster six, which is the bio cluster, which Antoine will be talking about later, later this, session, this, season, this session. So I will, I will concentrate here. The big difference between pillar one and pillar two is that uh, pillar one is bottom up from the point of view that you could propose a, well, a, an application, a proposal on any discipline you feel worth it. And if the proposal is good enough, it, it will be funded. On the other hand, in pillar two is top down, which means that the commission, after discussions with a lot of agents or actors, uh, establishes the problems that need to be solved in each, in each of these clusters. And our proposals have to respond to one of these problems. Therefore, if we want to propose a, a research project, it's got to be aimed at one of the at solving one of the problems that the commission is proposing. We will see all this uh, later in the season, but uh, I mean th this is the the main idea. Pillar one are bottom up uh, proposals open for any discipline. Pillar two are not. Pillar 2 is a top-down, uh, the, the description of, are called work programs, and the work programs describe the problems that need to be solved. The issue, I mean, the word innovation has different meanings depending on when we use them. Uh, the, the word innovation in the context of Horizon Europe has, has a very specific meaning. You will probably be aware of the, the technology readiness level scale, which is not a European Union creation. I believe it was created by NASA. Uh, basic, I mean, the idea is very simple. It, is, it just says that it's a nine step scale. Uh, TRL one is for science, basic scientific principles. TRL nine is for solutions already in the market and the others are in intermediate stages in the evolution of uh, of, uh, of research to the market uh, from the point of view of horizon europe innovation 
are the stages which come after research. In this particular case, more or less, and this is only approximate, innovation could be TRL six, maybe five to nine. Research would be TRLs one through four, five, maybe. In fact, there are two kinds of projects which are funded by the by the program, which are RIA, which are research and innovation actions or innovation actions. Research and innovation actions uh, are expected to generate results up to TRL four, maybe five. On the other hand, innovation actions are supposed to start typically with the results of previous projects, but that's, they're typically expected to start at TRL four, five, maybe, and generate results at TRL seven, maybe even eight. So this, this is the concept of innovation, which uh, sometimes give trouble. This, the program, uh, as I just mentioned, is a pretty large program. So there's a lot of documentation involved. The, we look here on the left-hand side, the legislative package, which establishes the program is already in place, was approved by the Commission of Parliament, by the Parliament uh, in 2020, I believe, for 2021. Uh, and it will be good for the whole seven years. Uh, but then there is an strategic plan, which is good for, there will be two, one for 21 to 24, and there will be another one for, for the last three years in the program. The strategic plan basically describes the, the impacts which are expected to reach within the uh, within the program, uh, and then every two years there is a work program. Uh, the work program uh, detail provides further details on the contents of the strategic plan. And with, what is very important is, is that it defines the topics towards which we should direct our project proposals. Each project proposal is going to be aimed at one particular topic in the work program. Uh, the calls for proposals uh, basically tells you well, the date on which uh, proposals for such and such topics are have have to be submitted for evaluation. Uh, we have, I mean, there is further documentation down, down here. I mean, in these uh, documents. Uh, again, what uh, it says here is that the strategy plan defines the expected impacts, uh, and the work program. Well, the work plan is divided in well, chapters called de destinations. In fact, the, the name destination comes because the, it is related to the, to the impact. But the, at the end of the day, the work program defines a number of topics, which are, which are uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, the promise which uh, pro projects need to solve. Uh, what what uh, what is called call for proposals is basically only a group of topics with one common deadline, and that's it. This is an example of the table of contents of uh, one work program, and in it, where, I mean, I'm trying to provide you a feeling of the of the content. Uh, the typical work program for one of these clusters in this particular, this is the cluster dealing with digital industry and space. Typically, each of these clusters uh, for two years is described in 200 pages, more mm -hmm. or less. Uh, as I said, the cluster is divided in uh, destinations, 
such as this distinction one, which is for Cayman neutral circulant DTI production. And again, the destinations are divided in, well, in sections in this particular case, but what matters are the topics, which are these topics. Each topic is described in a couple pages of text. Uh, well, it's got a, 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 a a topic number, uh, an ID, a topic ID. There's a description. It tells you whether this, they are expecting innovation actions or research and innovation actions. And it is, I mean, the topic, each of the topics describe the problem to solve. The, there's a description of the scope of the, the, what they do not describe is the technology which the commission is expecting to solve this problem. What they describe is the problem. It is for us proposing projects to, pro to propose the best possible technical solution to fix that problem. The topic also describes uh, the, the budget I mean, in most cases, it describes the budget that the commission expects for proposals. And they also explain, well, there's a number of, uh, of useful information. What is important, again, is the, the deadlines for proposals for each of these particular topics. There is a calendar for two years. And in this calendar, they tell you on which date, which, which date is the deadline for proposals for that topic. The, for, I mean, the current, well, the, this refers to the 21-22, but again, again, they say a work program for 23-24. And uh, this year we have had uh, topics with deadline in January. We have had some topics with, with a deadline in March, in April, uh, and so on. There will be, along the year, there will be deadlines for particular topics. As uh, Mrs. Bisman described, uh, the strategic plan uh, describes the importance that the Commission gives to international cooperation. Uh, of course, uh, the Commission realizes that not all smart people live in Europe. There is smart people all over the world. Therefore, in order to solve world-class problems, uh, we need to count on world-level uh, researchers or experts. Therefore, uh, the program is totally open to international cooperation. Uh, it, the concept of reciprocity and respect for uh, high values, what, is, what the, in the Commission has been calling uh, responsible research and innovation is very significant. And uh, also the Commission feels that the association of international countries as a, to the framework program is the strongest form of uh, international cooperation on research and innovation. In particular, the Commission is very interested in promoting international cooperation in the framework program. Uh, one of, I mean, in fact, uh, international cooperation has been going down during uh, Horizon 2020, and this is something that the, the Commission is trying to face and trying to solve. Therefore, in many cases, uh, I personally believe that the international cooperation will be good for the evaluation of project proposals in many cases. Well, these are a number of uh, official publications of the European Commission dealing on international cooperation, which I skip. And the, this uh, global approach is the, 
is the name, the name that the Commission is, is providing to this uh, strategy. Uh, as, as Mrs. Bisman mentioned, it promotes openness and values in research and innovation. Uh, it insists in reciprocity in a number of uh, topics. And in fact, there have been uh, bilateral roadmaps developed with a number of countries. In fact, uh, some of the well, uh, in order, what is clear is that in order to tackle global challenges, we need global uh, contributions to, to, to the solutions. And in fact, there is, there is a number of uh, uh, global challenges identified already, such as the Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance, the Mission Innovation, the climate change, uh, well, a number of uh, initiatives, and also uh, the, the Commission on has been trying to, to promote cooperation with, with uh, third countries, such as some specific target international cooperation actions. There are initiatives such as the Africa Initiative, the Mediterranean Initiative, the Europe, Europe China Roadmap, the Europe Latin America Action Plan, and the ASEAN EU uh, Dialogue. All of these actions are designed to, to promote uh, cooperation. Uh, Mrs. Buisman mentioned already that any organization from any country in the world uh, can partner in a Euro Horizon Europe uh, project. And this is true, uh, well, almost, because Russia and Belarus, I believe, are the only two countries who, who have been forbidden participation in, in these projects. There are three types of countries at, from the point of view of Horizon Europe. First, there are the member states, the 10, 27 member states of the European Union. And of course, the, they can participate in the program because they are, they are defining it. Then we have uh, international countries who have signed an association a agreement with Horizon Europe. And by means of this agreement, their organizations can participate in the program in pretty much with pretty much equal rights to member state uh, organizations. Uh, the list of associated states uh, what well, is here in this link. Uh, the, this list uh, is evolving. In fact, uh, New Zealand is uh, only pending signature of the agreement, which will possibly take place this year. Uh, Canada is pretty close to signing the agreement also, and there, there are discussions going on with other countries. So this is a, a list which, which is still alive. And all other countries which are none of these two are what the Commission calls well, third countries or international countries, which are all others in general. Uh, here, there are two classes also. There, there is a group of countries, fairly large gr group of countries, which, uh, of, I mean, all of them can participate in the program, but some of these countries will be funded by the Commission, and some others will not be funded by the Commission. They will have to find, find their own funding in, well, by, by their own means. Uh, all this is described in this program guide to Horizon Europe. And in the particular case of uh, Southeast Asia, the status as of today is this status. Within ASEAN, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, uh, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam uh, organizations from these countries will be funded by the Commission in equal conditions as the case of uh, I don't know, 
partners from Germany or France or what, whatever uh, European countries. Uh, there are currently undergoing talks with uh, Japan and South Korea, and well, there are some discussions with, with the other countries, but for the time being, these countries which are listed in red, they will have to find fund their own participation in, in projects. As, as I mentioned, this the program guide to the to Horizon Europe uh, updates this 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 list from time to time. A typical pillar two project, and I mean and I mean a research and innovation action or an innovation action, which is the typical consortium proposal. I mean, uh, this these projects are proposed by a consortium, a consortium of organizations from different countries. Uh, in order to be eligible, this consortium is going to include partners from more than three countries. Uh, this country must include at least one member state, at least one which could be a member state or an associated states, and a number of uh, possible uh, third countries. Uh, the three is the minimum number of countries, but the total number of countries could be much larger, could be 20 or could be, could be even more, depend, depending on the nature of the project. The organ, the partners, the organizations who are going to carry out this project could be of any, any kind public or private. Uh, they could be enterprises, they could be research centers, universities, public administration, whatever as the kind as the nature of the project requires. They cannot be individual persons. Individual persons are eligible for pillar one, but not for pillar two. And something which is so often uh, a matter of discussion as is the IPR of the results generated in the project. The IPR does not belong to the European Commission. IPR belongs to, to the consortium, to the consortium itself, who, which carries out the, the project. Uh, the consortium will have to decide or agree among themselves who owns what out of the IPR generated in the consortium. By default, the typical, typical, I mean, the default agreement is that whoever develops something, well, that something belongs to whoever has developed it. But uh, the party, I mean, a particular consortium could reach a different agreement. That depends on the consortium. There is not a matter for the commission. As I, as I mentioned, uh, this is not research for research, but research to solve some problem. And in fact, the contract with the commission requires uh, exploitation or use of the results of the project. Therefore, the grant agreement uh, has some exploitation requirements included in it. The, typ the typical project in, under pillar two will probably be around three years project, three, three and a half, maybe some in, some, in some cases they could be two and a half year projects, which means that uh, we're talking of medium, medium term uh, projects and also we should take in, into account that the results of the project will not be at tier nine but uh, they will still need some further develop development in order to reach the market i i had a note here uh, during horizon 2020 saying that the typical project would, would involve 10 partners from five countries even though this there's a lot of variation here, but this, this is no longer the case under Horizon Europe. Uh, I have been checking data statistics 
on, on Croatia and Europe to date. And uh, the average is over 15 partners today in PR2 in Croatia and Europe. Therefore, projects which have been approved under Croatia and Europe to date are in general involve a larger consortium than, than in under Horizon 2020. The budget, well, the average budget as of today has been six and a half million. Uh, of course, there are projects with a lot, I mean, with much, much larger budgets, and also there are projects with smaller budgets. But I mean, this is trying to, to provide you an idea of sizes. And as I mentioned, uh, depending on the roles needed in the project, the partners could be of many kinds. What well, typically in all in all projects, there are research centers or universities. Also, in almost I mean, in all all projects, there are enterprises. But also, also I mean, in many cases, there are facility of, of or lab providers for for pilots, for demonstrators, for prototypes. Typically. Uh, facility or lab providers are either enterprises or research organizations of some kind. Uh, depending on who runs experimentation, it could be enterprises. Depending on, I mean, for the exploitation role, typically enterprises carry, carry out exploitation. Dissemination of communication is also needed. Others. Uh, there could be, a, I mean, in fact, there are a lot of different others. Uh, if we are de dealing with uh, health related topics, hospitals, uh, public or private health administrations, whatever. If we are dealing with the uh, agro or food, well, there are other, other partners. Uh, we could um, very often have ministries or town halls as partners in projects, because uh, many of the problems uh, to solve deal with uh, town halls. Really, any kind of organization, uh, as long as it's as the, the nature of the project requires it, uh, can, uh, can and will be needed as partner. In fact, uh, this is again data on um, currently funded Horizon Europe uh, projects uh, up to April. We can see here that the dark blue, the dark blue section is uh, well, what the Commission called HES, which are basically universities. Pretty much one third of the funding uh, is provided to universities. But again, almost 30% of the funding, uh, this light blue, is provided to enterprises. And again, 20 some percent is, uh, is received by research organizations. But there are also a lot of public bodies receiving up to, well, for the time being, 5.5% of the funding. And there is a group of others. And in fact, among the enterprises, 17.5% uh, of the funding goes to SMEs, which uh, might be surprising to some, but uh, SMEs are a very significant actor in the, in the, in the framework program. And also in these proposals, there are a number of uh, cross, what the commission calls, calls cross-cutting issues. Uh, I already mentioned that dissemination and exploitation of the project results is very important. In fact, uh, there is a section in the proposal in which uh, we should at least provide ideas on how are we going to deal, uh, deal with the exploitation of the project results. There is also communication, which is uh, important. Uh, gender equality is very important. Uh, related uh, the, the environment 
the do not significant harm principle is something we must we must uh, take into into account. Open science, which is very significant in Croatia and Europe, it was uh, what is a is an evolution of the requirements in Horizon 2020, and the issue of uh, ethics, uh, responsible research and innovation, etc. All these again are described in the in the program guide. I mentioned that the, the commission funds the projects. What does funding mean? What it means is that the, the commission would pay for the cost of carrying out uh, the project. It would not pay for profit, but it does pay for the cost of carrying out the research. All kinds of direct costs, labor, travel, expenditures, uh, subcontracts, uh, whatever it is, uh, typically is a uh, eligible cost. And also uh, a global figure of 25% of the direct cost under the concept of indirects. And out of this figure, in research and innovation actions, the commission will pay 100% of this figure. In innovation actions and for enterprises or for profit organizations, uh, the commission will pay only 70%, in some cases, 60% of the cost. For non-profit organizations, it will, I mean, the commission will always, will always pay uh, 100%. And of course, there will there will have to be a cost justification, which typically takes place at the midterm review and at the final review. In which case, we just tell the commission what we have had these costs, and the commission will pay us uh, up to the maximum. With the maximum, maximum is the contract. Uh, the co contract figure, but up to that maximum, if the costs are justifiable and accepted, the, the Commission will, will pay them. Of course, for the execution of the project, which as you have seen are relatively complex uh, projects involving a, a very large number of partners in several, in several countries, well, the project needs to be professionally managed by the consortium itself, of course. There will have to be a project manager, there will have to be an expectation team, there will be a technical committee, there will be different bodies as the project requires and as the consortium decides. There will be typically two contracts in the, in the project. The first one is the grant agreement between the consortium and the commission. And the second one will be the collaboration agreement within the, con the consortium only, which typically uh, details uh, issues of interest for the consortium and for the partners. The commission is not involved in the collaboration agreement. Which kind of issues are discussed here? Well, the the project management architecture within the within the project. Uh, how are we going to deal with the IPR within the consortium? Uh, well, th this kind of things. Uh, there are there are models which can be used as a as a guideline for these collaboration agreements. Uh, I have a few examples here of uh, post of existing uh, mm -hmm. projects uh, involving uh, international collaboration. Uh, George is going to talk on, on this issue later as well. So uh, we'll see which typical, which projects are typical. Well, there are many kinds of projects in which uh, are very likely to involve in international cooperation. For example, uh, we have had in the past, um, I, I don't know whether now, but in the past we have had a research project dealing with the Zika, malaria, dengue, 
and other uh, sicknesses which in fact do not exist in Europe because, uh, because of the weather in Europe, which is colder. Uh, in, this part, in these projects, of course, uh, the consortium is got to, has got to involve uh, partners from Asia, from Africa, from Latin America, in which uh, these sicknesses do exist in order to be able to, to deal with them. There are also project, projects dealing with, uh, with the Pacific Ocean and border countries, in which, uh, of course, border countries are needed. And also, a very typical case is uh, problems which are worldwide problems, uh, which uh, need, uh, which typically involve uh, some pilot or some, or some demonstrator in some place in Europe, but also in order to demonstrate that these solutions we're proposing are applicable in other countries, we will need a demonstrator, demonstrators also in, I mean, in, other, in other regions of the world. And in particular, there, there are a number, of, a number of topics in which the commission itself describes the topics as being specifically suitable for international cooperation. International cooperation is possible in all topics in the world program, but some topics are specifically uh, very good for international cooperation. And I believe that the proposals to these topics, which do not involve some international partners, Will be will have a weaker evaluation that proposals which do involve international partners. Uh, in particular, uh, there is I mean there is the typical the Commission has developed the what they call the funding and tenders uh, opportunities portal. This is a portal with I mean the the main repository of information on the framework program. Uh, you can search for funding and tenders for topics and for a number of information. And one of the facilities is this one I'm pointing out here. Uh, one of the specific priorities on with which they classify, classify the topics are international cooperation, and in particular, in the work program 2324, uh, they identified 96 topics which uh, they specifically uh, claim that are suitable for international cooperation. Uh, the work program, I mean, the, the complete work program involves uh, 600 and some topics. The, um, the only issue is that uh, we are already in May. Uh, there have been calls for proposals whose deadline has already been completed. Therefore, the, what remains as either open for submission or forthcoming are 457 uh, topics. Therefore, in pretty much 20 20% of them, the Commission uh, identifies these topics as specifically suitable for international cooperation, which is, which is good. Which could be a, an international partnership in a, in a project proposal? Uh, well, it could be a country, I mean, a group of several uh, partners from one particular country. Typically, there could be a user, which is somebody who is going to run some, some kind of, uh, who has a problem, uh, who is going to run some kind of a demonstrator, pilot, whatever. And a, a research and innovation provider, a local research innovation provider, who is typically a research center or university, who is going to support uh, this user 
in in the in in their work. Uh, the user could be, I mean, could be of any kind. Could be an enterprise, could be a town hall or public administration, could be a hospital, whatever. Uh, it is not likely that uh, international partners will act as project coordinators for a number of uh, practical reasons. But uh, of course, there's no problem for these uh, partners to be to be I mean, partners, partners in the in the project. And of course, this is not a requirement. It's not mandatory. This is only a, a possibility. I've got a couple examples here which could provide you an idea of existing projects involving uh, third, country, third country partners, non-associated third country partners. This is an example of a Horizon 2020 project which started in January 2020 and is a four year long project. It's called Solution Plus. This is its project ID. It is with an integrated urban e mobility for the new urban agenda. It involves 46 partners, 18 million euro of funding. 14 of these 46 partners are non-associated third countries. And if we look for here down, we see that there are two partners from Vietnam, two partners from the Philippines, one from Nepal, a group of partners from Africa, and a group of partners from uh, Latin America. You will, I mean, this is, uh, is dealing with urban immobility. Therefore, a number, a number of town halls are involved. In the case of Vietnam, we have uh, Hanoi and the university, a university providing support to, to, to the town hall. In the case of the Philippines, we have PASIC with a research center providing support to, to the town hall. I mean, this uh, in the case of well, similar cases in in the case of Colombia, we have we have an association of uh, organizations. In the case of Ecuador, we have a town hall, which is Quito, and so on. And again, I mean, all these countries are uh, are in the list of automatically funded countries by the program. I don't know why the, the city of Hanoi did not ask for funding, but all the other, all the other uh, countries are, are funded by the, by the program itself. Uh, this is a, another example. Again, this is a, a what is a project called Interlace is a Horizon 2020 starting in 2020 for four years, 21 partners out of which nine are uh, third countries. The topic was asking for collaboration between Latin America and Europe. Therefore, all, all these in, uh, international partners are from Latin America. But again, here we have a, a country groups in which, for example, for Ecuador, we have a town hall supported by, eco, by an enterprise. In Costa Rica, we have a, a town hall supported by a university and also with an association of local governments. In the case of Colombia, well, it's similar. Uh, but this, this is the, the example. These are three topics uh, which whose deadline was in end of March this year. They are meant as examples of a possible topic. I mean, they, these are real, real topics. They are close already. The first one uh, was asking for an international hub for digital partnerships in the Indo-Pacific area, uh, the proposal—I mean, the proposals have been already submitted. They will be undergoing evaluation right now, and in uh, this execution of all these, uh, whatever proposal is selected 
for all these three uh, topics will probably start uh, operating in possibly towards the end of the year or maybe January next year. The second one is with uh, R&I cooperation with South Saharan Africa. And the third one is for Latin America. Uh, so in these cases, the topic itself is telling you which kind of international partners you are going to need. I mean, it's clear that an international hub for digital partnership with the Indo-Pacific without Indo-Pacific partners is impossible. I've got a couple more examples, but uh, I don't know whether it's worth getting into details. May I go into this? I mean, this is a, a bio-related uh, project. In fact, this is a project. It's, again, it's a Horizon 2020 project starting in 2020. This is a very long project, 54 months. Uh, I mean, very, very long. That's not uh, the average by far. I mean, Typically, projects are three years, three and a half years. Uh, in this case, there were 32 partners. Three of them are from uh, third countries. Budget is over for 8 million. And in this case, we had a, a partner from Thailand who received a grant from, uh, from, the, from the program itself. And two partners from New Zealand and from the, the States, and none of them did receive any funding from the program. They, 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 did, they did probably receive funding from the local uh, funds. As I mentioned, uh, this is the... Well, not, there's not much time left. Uh, um, so this, uh, this is the funding and tenders portal. All information related to the, to the program is in here. Uh, there's all kinds of information here uh, related to searching, identifying uh, topics of interest, uh, how to participate, uh, looking for already executed projects which could be related to our interests and so on. Uh, CORDIS is the database of uh, EU-funded projects since 1990. For all projects, there is uh, some information there. There is an abstract of the project. There is the list of uh, project partners. There is uh, I mean, some information such as the total budget, uh, how much budget did each of, each of the partners received, uh, dates on which uh, the work was executed, uh, the contact to public uh, information, publication, even re results, and also a contact. Uh, therefore, this is, uh, in general, very interesting uh, information. Also, statistics, I will not go into here, but the statistics, uh, there's a lot of, of statistics on the framework program already executed. In general, for funded projects, uh, statistics, I mean, information is available online. Proposals are not public. Therefore, a, a consortium presenting a proposal, I mean, proposals are not made public at all because they still, they are IPR belonging to the consortium. Uh, there is, uh, this is a seminar which uh, has been taking place uh, several times uh, online. Uh, if you are interested in going through the funding and tenders portal, uh, this is uh, interesting information. It shows you how, how to do it. And uh, the, the recording is available here. So this is uh, information useful. And I am running out of time. So 
I have a few slides here. Uh, by the way, these slides are available to, to anybody who's interested. So there are, I mean, the, the Funny Antenna's portal has uh, some facilities for partner search. Uh, there are other facilities such as the NCP network, and Antoine is going to be talking about uh, how the NCP can support you in, in become, I mean, in becoming involved in possible consortium. There are other facilities such, a, such as the Enterprise Judo Network, the Ideal IST Network. Uh, of course, the Euraccess Euras, uh, Worldwide uh, Network. And uh, there are other facilities. Uh, Kior just mentioned that the uh, there are a number of uh, consultancy organizations who will be happy to help you for a fee, of course. Uh, try to try to uh, get involved in potential consortiums, uh, well, I mean, whatever, whatever it is. I mean, the, the, they are, I mean, they are useful often. And of course, the, com the commission organizes uh, what they call info days. Uh, typically, they are organized whenever a new work program is presented or whenever uh, a call for proposals is uh, open. Uh, these are all examples uh, from December last year, but uh, on this uh, on Europe Info Day page, there is an up an outdate and an up to date uh, list of uh, the existing uh, Info Days. Typically, Info Days used to take place in Brussels, but since the pandemic, most of them are online. Therefore, I mean they're available. They're available. And uh, this is it. Sorry, I'm a bit late, I believe. But, thank you uh, so much, Miko. No, that's that. That was great. Uh, thank you so much. A wealth of information coming from you. And we have a lot of questions here. But as you said, we are uh, running out of time. But uh, let, let me just squeeze in with just one question. Uh, there's a question here that says, how is a joint proposal submitted, especially with the participation of uh, third countries? I mean, the, the, the funding and tenders portal uh, has facilities for proposal, uh, not only to submit them, but also to generate the proposal. Because if you, if any organization wants to be involved in the proposal, they will first they will have to register in the in the portal. Then uh, the organization needs to apply for the PIC, which is the is an ID number for each uh, organization. I mean, it's a very easy procedure, takes a few minutes. Uh, and the, the idea is to, I mean, to, to avoid problems, which uh, mm -hmm. used to take place in the past. And then uh, each proposal has got a proposal coordinator, which is typically is an organization with experience in the program. And this organization arranges things so that uh, all partners can prepare their contributions to the proposal uh, more or less easily. Uh, at the end of the day, there's the, each proposal has got a number of uh, standard information such as who is the who is the partner partner description which comes out of the peak uh, was a, a number of general information and then there is the the project proposal itself which is the which is typically called the part b and uh, in drafting the part b all all partners uh, share the well, make their contributions and again the Typically, the coordinator packs everything together and uh, sum, at the end of the day, presses the button for submission of the proposal. And hopefully it gets funded. <laughs> well, well, success rates in Horizon 2020 is better than they used to be under Horizon 2020. 
but still is around 16, 17 perfect percent. So it's not, uh, I mean, if you, I mean, if you participate in the consortium, submit the proposal and your proposal is not funded the first time, I mean, do not be discouraged. I mean, this yes. happens to everybody. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very good, uh, very good uh, reminder. Please don't get discouraged. And of course, if you continue to attend uh, the info sessions of your access and, and ASEAN, we try to be as, uh, as uh, we provide information as much as possible. So uh, please continue to be in touch so that we ha you have more chances of winning. So Mikkel, I'll let you go. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to be with us uh, today. And now we, we go to our next speaker, Antoine. Uh, Mikkel uh, was talking about being an NCP, actually. So there is a national contact points, and these are who have particular expertise in the different uh, clusters or different pillars of Horizon Europe. And you are certainly uh, an NCP coordinator for France. And you're going to talk to us about cluster six. And I, and I know that it's of big interest to many of the people in the room. So, so the room is yours. Thank you. Thank you very, mu very much. Uh, so for, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Araxis for inviting me uh, and giving me the opportunity to present the cluster six of Horizon Europe. And thank you also to Mikel who gave a very, very complete uh, introduction. I know it can be a lot of information and a bit overwhelming, but you have our contacts and you can still uh, write to us and ask questions. Um, so I would, I, uh, so as uh, I have been introduced earlier, I am the uh, French coordinator of uh, the national contact point for cluster six, which is a part of Horizon Europe, which is dedicated to the topics of food, bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture, and environment. I believe in terms of topics, it's uh, one of the widest uh, cluster. Uh, yes, one of the widest clusters of the second pillar. Uh, we cover a lot of areas. Uh, so I have uh, displayed here the graph that represents the structure of Horizon Europe that Mikael has al already introduced. And as you can see, uh, we are located in the pillar two, which is uh, the pillar dedicated to global challenges. And the idea is to answer to big uh, issues and cover uh, and cover topics in, um, depending on several areas. And so uh, in all of the clusters, as Mikael has already said, the idea is to build proposals where you have several partners uh, and where, of course, uh, participants from uh, from uh, from your countries can also take part, but I will come back to that a little bit later. I will try to uh, give you an introduction about the cluster six itself and its topics and its structures, what kind of uh, uh, fields it covers ex in more detail, how is it uh, how is it split. Then I will say a few words about um, the international cooperation within cluster six and where you can find opportunities uh, as people from Asian countries. Um, then I will show and display the topics for 2024 where ha I have highlighted those that mentioned explicitly international cooperation and say a few words at the end about uh, how to get support from NCPs. Uh, so just in terms of uh, context, uh, so it's very important to know when you apply to Horizon Europe call uh, that there are a lot of European policies that already exist. And uh, it's important to have an idea of the policies that concern the topic you want to answer to because it will be expected when you will be preparing the uh, impact section of a proposal to have a little bit of idea on, in terms of how your project will be able to uh, have an impact uh, related to the main European policies. And obviously the cluster six is really related to one of the biggest European policies of the moment, which is the European Green Deal. Um, so uh, in terms of, of, of context, most of the uh, chapters and destinations of cluster six are related to uh, some of the objectives of the Green Deal, for example, uh, eliminating pollution, uh, leading the change, of, um, having food from farm to fork, protecting nature, etc. So I would advise if you're interested in the topics of cluster six to have a look at what is contained in the European Green Deal. Of course, it's not the only policy that, it, that is interesting in relation to the cluster six, but it's one of the biggest ones. And it's very important to have this idea of what the European, um, the European Commission can have in mind uh, in terms of impacts. 
Um, so here I just have put very quickly a few keywords that can help you to see uh, what are the areas covered by the cluster six. And as you can see, it's quite wide. We can go really from biodiversity to a bioeconomy, uh, climate action, blue, blue economy. So it's very, very wide. And I think that <laughs> most of you can find uh, opportunities that interest you within the cluster six because it, it is so wide. So now in terms of structure, so as Miguel has very clearly explained, um, the clusters from the pillar two are split in what are called destinations. So these are chapters where you will find the calls in the work program. Um, the cluster six uh, is made of seven chapters, seven destinations that cover uh, different topics. Uh, so I have displayed these uh, topics on the next slide. So the first one is called uh, BioDiv in short and it's covering everything related to biodiversity and ecosystem services. Uh, once again, you know, uh, in a wide uh, range of uh, topics. So it can be transforming biodiversity, integrating biodiversity in more economical matters. It can be restoring biodiversity. It's quite, quite wide. Then the second one is more focused on agriculture, it's called farm to fork, and it's about uh, food production and consumption. So once again, this one is quite wide as well. So it's all about food systems. Um, as Mikel has, has said earlier, it's very important to have different types of actors uh, that are involved in your proposals. And uh, for farm to fork, it's very, uh, it's, uh, I think the greatest example, they will really expect farmers, research centers, companies, service providers in those projects. Uh, so it's very important to, to have that in mind. Then we have circular, uh, Cirque Bio, which is about circular economy, bio-based products um, and uh, recycling, for example. We have zero pollution, which is very obvious in its title. So no pollutions on land, in seas and in the air. Um, another chapter on which is called climate and which targets mostly um, the impact that human activities and ecosystems can have on climate change and uh, how we can have a better knowledge in order to mitigate the climate change and adapt also to the future, uh, to the consequences of the climate change. Um, so it's a bit different from climate mo models that can be found in another cluster. Uh, then we have a chapter dedicated to uh, rural, coastal and urban communities. So this one is really about the people and how to support the communities uh, in relation to uh, many aspects, but including climate, uh, climate change aspects as well, and access to innovation and digital solutions too. And the last chapter is a, a little bit of a mix of everything. It's called governance, but it doesn't include only governance aspects, but mostly it will be about supporting governance schemes and policies, everything about digital tools and data as uh, catalyzers, and uh, knowledge innovation systems in agriculture. So basically, this is a structure of the cluster six. Uh, so, yeah, if you're interested in one of those topics, you can have a look uh, in the work program. Then I uh, will say a few words about international cooperation in Cluster 6 of Horizon Europe. So, obviously, when you look at the topics, it's uh, very easy to see that um, international cooperation is very relevant for Cluster 6 because we cover issues that are not only concerning Europe and that have to be tackled at the global level, including erosion of biodiversity, climate change, uh, evolution in agriculture, pollution, uh, all of these aspects uh, have a very strong relevance in terms of international cooperation. And so I will not go in crazy detail because Mikael has already said a few words, but basically in Cluster 6, you will find several tips of um, types of international cooperation in topics. You will have sometimes uh, in targeted international cooperation where some countries will be explicitly mentioned, but in Cluster 6, it's covered mainly, it's, it's concerning mainly China and most African countries. And also you will have not targeted international cooperation where uh, it will be mentioned that uh, international cooperation is expected, but without mentioning which countries. So it means it's free for all. <laughs> 
um, most of the time, uh, ex except in a few cases, like with China and African countries, it will, it will be mentioned in eligibility conditions. Um, international cooperation will be mentioned uh, explicitly, but in loose terms and loose ways. So you will have, uh, so here I have put a table where you can uh, see the type, the type of wordings that can indicate that it's, it is really expected and encouraged to have uh, international cooperation in your cluster six project. So, for example, you have international cooperation may be encouraged and they can precise with which country afterwards. Uh, but as Mikel has already said earlier, even if it's not mentioned explicitly in the text, it doesn't mean that you cannot take part. All the countries, unless it's specifically written, can take part and all low and middle income countries are eligible for funding people um, and countries with higher um, uh, higher with more more money can take part but with their own budget but technically in all the cluster six calls i haven't seen a topic where it is forbidden to include international cooperation so uh, feel free to have a look at all the topics and if you're interested uh, it's possible to join um, so now I will go in to detail about the 2024 work program. So I will showcase the topics uh, for the next year. And here are the deadlines first. So uh, technically the platform will be open for submission from 17th of October, but the deadline for uh, the projects will be 22nd of February. So I will not maybe not explain in detail, but you have some projects which are in one stage, and so you have to submit a full proposal in February, and other proposals where you have to submit just an abstract or uh, of uh, a limited abstract for February, and then there will be a second stage after a pre-selection step in September. So now we'll go uh, through the destinations and showcase the topics and the uh, calls that will be open that are already open uh, for next year. And I have highlighted in red those that mention in the text that they expect international co cooperation. So it will be not such a good thing to not include it in the project. However, all the projects, all the calls that are in blue are also open to you. It just means that uh, it's not specifically mentioned and encouraged, but it, you can still take part if it's relevant. So bio, BioDiv, as I said, it's covering mostly biodiversity. Uh, you can see all the topics here. I will not go through all of them because the time is a little bit limited, but you can see that uh, the two topics in red mention international cooperation explicitly. So we have digital for nature and conservation and protection of carbon rich and biodiversity rich forest ecosystems. So if you're interested in those topics, you can uh, for sure have a look. Uh, and here I have put like the topics that are in two stages and two, two steps that I explained, but there are no uh, um, explicit mentions of international cooperation. Then we have farm to fork and this it's the same. We have uh, topics that do not mention it, but are still open. And one topic that mentioned it explicitly and its impact of the development of novel foods based on alternative source of proteins. So it's more about processing and new sources. Uh, and you also have uh, a topic on microbiome for flavor and texture in the organ organolytic dietary shift. So these two are uh, encouraging the um, are encouraging co international cooperation. Same here with tackling outbreaks of plant pests. Uh, then in the circular economy uh, chapter, we have a topic which is on. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on this one, but on program biodegradation capability of bio-based materials and products validated in specific environments. So you see, it's not only about agriculture or biodiversity, you so have more industrial topics within uh, cluster six that are open to international cooperation. In here, here you have like the following topics uh, for next year as well. Um, same, in, in, still in Cirque Bio, you also have the topics, new circular solutions and decentralized approaches for water and wastewater management. Yes, we also have like uh, a lot of topics and uh, things for water in cluster six. And we have circular design of bio-based processes and products. Um, zero pollution, which is a smaller chapter, has two opportunities for you. Uh, best available techniques to recover or recycle fertilizing products from secondary raw materials and environmental impacts of food systems, which is quite a wide topic, <laughs> to be frank. 
um, climate has uh, one topic which is focused mostly only on China cooperation because China has signed a few agreements with the uh, European uh, Commission where they uh, have uh, said that they will they will pay for their uh, researchers that will take part to the uh, to these uh, topics. Uh, in communities, you have two topics. You have uh, one which is not very relevant for uh, for ASEAN countries, which is more about Arctic coastal uh, communities, and one which can interest you about new sustainable business and production models for farmers and rural communities. And eventually, in the chapter governance, uh, you have mostly one topic that will interest you because the first one that I have highlighted is open to international cooperation, but it's uh, more like complex in it for more of for internal use, but it's the one that can interest you is regional ecosystems of innovation to foster food system transformation. So I know I have went through really fast, but it's because there are a lot of topics. And if there are some topics that interest you, please get support and uh, you can write to to uh, our uh, our colleagues from Orexes. You can write to us. You can write, or you can contact NCPs. And I will just say a few words about NCP support that you can get, uh, even as countries that are not in the European Union or uh, associated countries. So um, Mikael has introduced a website, the NCP portal, which is a very good source of information if you want to find uh, support in all the topics. But more specifically, uh, if you're interested in the cluster six topics, there is a project that exists that is called Care for Bio. Um, and it's technically the national, uh, the network of national contact points for cluster six, so including me. Um, and so we are going to provide, and we are already providing content and support to cluster six applicants from all over the world. Um, and there will be a lot of things coming. So the idea is that the project is trying to have a widening strategy and to provide tools to all partners uh, all potential partners from all the, all over the world. So the project organizes trainings for applicants. So uh, please have a look at the newsletter and at the website to see when trainings uh, are open. Um, we also organize matchmaking activities. So they will be physically organized in Brussels this year, but like always, there will be a platform open for networking online where you can register and you can still contact people without going to Brussels because I imagine it can be a little bit complicated and expensive. Um, and there will also be some uh, short videos called awareness raising events where we will introduce more like technical uh, aspects of Horizon Europe and the Cluster 6 and it will be available on YouTube. So please have a look at the content that we provide in Care for Bio. Um, here I have put on the slide as well uh, the link to register to the newsletter, the social media, and the website itself. And also uh, on the NCP portal, you can uh, find and have a look at the different NCPs, national content points that exist. And for Philippines and Thailand, there are uh, national content point that exists, you can contact them directly. Otherwise, if your country doesn't have a national contact point, please contact a national content point for another country, and we will try to help you as best as we can. Um, so that would be it, I believe. I hope I'm not too late because it was a lot of things. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Antoine. Um, it's so great to know, uh, or, I mean, all of these things and thank you for painstakingly identifying those uh, those grants that are uh, or those those calls that are open for international cooperation. We really appreciate it. So uh, with your permission, we'd like to share your presentation uh, to those who attended this meeting, if that's OK. And thank yes, you so please. for OK, <laughs> great. And thank you so for talking about care for bio. Uh, I think uh, I think I speak for everybody here. Um, we would love to to get in uh, get in touch. Uh, as I, uh, as uh, Susanna said earlier, this is a and also I, I mentioned it. This is a part of a series, and so we have also um, other sessions that are coming up. Specific uh, specific sessions uh, coming up. So um, we would love to be in touch as well. So um, also there is a question here that I'd like. Maybe you can you can take if you don't mind. Uh, this is a simple question, but maybe something that we we, we miss, especially if it's uh, uh, if it's somebody who is just starting to learn about Horizon Europe. Can a third country, you know, or, or for example, ASEAN countries, can they lead the consortium, or does it have to be a European institution? 
Well, it's uh, it's a, it's a complex question because technically, I would believe uh, I believe it's possible. I, I hope I'm not so saying something uh, uh, saying something wrong. Michael maybe can confirm or infirm. But um, depending on the topic, I I don't know if it would be the most appreciated uh, in terms of evaluation. I don't know if it would be the best received coordination unless it's very very relevant. Uh, but usually it's mostly European uh, or associated countries that take the lead. Okay, so Antoine, I'll, I'll put you in the back uh, for, for now, but uh, I'll bring everybody in uh, for a last uh, uh, round table. Uh, but uh, for now, I thank, we thank you so much. And I, I would like now to bring in uh, Georg Meltzer uh, Venturi, who can give us uh, the many successful <laughs> projects that he is a part of <laughs> and uh, to inspire everybody you know, to take part uh, on in Horizon Europe. So Georg, thank you so much for waiting and the floor is finally yours. No worries, Jen, thanks a lot. Um, so I'm gonna start with the easy part, um, which is the running project that we have um, that has a, uh, a, a Asian partner in it. So it's, it's about water resource management and where did we come from? Um, where, does this, uh, where does this project start? Um, so the, the coordinator is uh, IASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis um, in Austria, and this is their team. And uh, we at your team over one of the uh, one of the project partners. I'm not a, a, a although I am a, a researcher by training. I've gone more into the pro uh, project management side of things. Um, what is uh, SOS Water? Uh, as a, as a project. So we're a, a group of mostly um, university or research centers that are uh, looking at this problem of the safe operating space of water. And you can see here that we have the Southern Institute for Water Resource Planning, uh, SWIRP in Vietnam as one of our partners. Um, I'll just go through the project real quick and then sort of rewind to, to where this whole thing came from, um, since it's not about technical stuff, but so there was the, the call in cluster six on uh, improved understanding, observation, and more monitoring of water resource availability. And it specifically said in the call text, and this is what uh, Antoine was saying earlier, you know, sometimes it says that river basins within and outside Europe should be considered. So it's a global thing, you know, and then, then you can do it. What, what are you going to do? Yeah, the Amazon, and at the end of the day, who do you choose? You choose people you know. Yeah, because there's millions of river basins and at the end of the day, you, you go back to your friends usually, right? So this is just a little bit of an overview of what the context is, but I don't think that's super relevant um, in, in the context that we're, that we're talking now. Um, but uh, you know, a quick overview is what we want to do is we want to define a modeling system that enables us to understand where are we currently with, uh, with our, our um, water systems? Where are we uh, going into areas where it's becoming extremely um, critical? And where are the, the areas where we're still you know, uh, doing okay? And this is um, uh, what we're doing. So basically there's always an area where it's safe and then where it starts getting dangerous. And then you know, where are you going towards um, uh, environmental collapse and nobody wants to go in that direction. Um, so basically what we had to do is uh, we had to identify indicators and boundaries to see where, uh, you know, what, what's possible, what can we measure? Because a lot of things that, that are interesting and relevant can't be directly measured. Uh, then use that uh, to set up a, a modeling system and uh, bench that, benchmark that with earth, earth observation data, um, then co-locate that with um, values because at the end of the day, what we're always talking about is trade-offs. And one of the things I always said was, well, how many beavers is one megawatt of hydropower worth? And the stupid answer is it depends. If you have millions of beavers and no electricity, then, then, then the hydropower is more important. If you have three beavers and lots of, uh, lots of other sources of electricity, then you know, the, the, the local stakeholders might have a different opinion. So it's a lot about what are the local values and how do I, can I use that when I'm planning and changing and adapting water systems and water use? Um, this is a very theoretical how we, how we split up the, the, the work, but basically we're doing earth systems monitoring indicators and then designing uh, this, uh, this method about it. 
Lots of fancy pictures, always good for proposals to have lots of pictures. Here an overview of the areas that we're looking at. And in Southeast Asia, we're looking at the Mekong Delta. And we've defined these challenges that we're going to be looking at uh, in, the, uh, in, in the various areas. And this was really uh, like this in the proposal stage. So it's, you see, it's important to really show what you're doing. This is just an overview of the time plan. It's a four year project with 11 partners. So a lot of things going on um, more or less in the, uh, uh, in the in the parameters that we've been talking about earlier. But I think um, the, the, the important part in this project, I would say is that it was mandatory to include uh, a partner from outside Europe. Right, and then uh, that 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 that's where it gets interesting. Now, I want to backtrack a little bit because as as I was uh, setting this up, I said, well, there's a couple other interesting projects um, that I have been working on uh, and that I want to showcase here. Although they're they're all long gone, um, one was Epic, which was the EU Pacific Partnership uh, for ICT. So here, where we're trying to uh, encourage participation and collaboration from Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand. In the area of IT, um, it was a two-year project where we did where we organized a lot of research exchanges, and based on these research exchanges, then um, uh, joint research projects, which then led to um, joint uh, funded research projects. It's uh, the, the problem with a lot of this work is, is is it's very long term, and and you don't get results very quickly. Um, so, but this was. Um, Susanna might know this. These are my slides from the last time I was in Singapore. <laughs> so basically, you, you're, you're losing. Uh, there, there's a lot of there, there's a lot of work that needs to be going on in the background. But I think you know, I'm preaching to the choir here. Most of you guys know um, um, uh, what's going on. What's interesting though is that we do have uh, uh, we did write uh, to the Commission a course of action on how we can improve uh, this collaboration and partnership. And you know the easy answer uh, that you can always throw at uh, at the commission is just well you know just fund it. Um, but obviously that's that's you know not such a, a, a trivial answer because at the end of the day the commission answers to the European taxpayer, and uh, you are going to have to find a good reason for a European taxpayer money to go outside the country unless uh, there's a reciprocal effect in there. So it's 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 not always so trivial. Um, one of the uh, uh, things that Antoine was actually mentioning in an upcoming call is an, another project that I worked on a couple of years ago. So this is, oh my God, 10 years, my God. Um, that was uh, basically using uh, fly maggots as a source of protein for animal feed. And in this, uh, uh, in this topic also, it was mandatory. They don't really say it's mandatory. They say it's strongly suggested, or, or you know, the, the wording is. But you know, suggested means mandatory in in EU talk. Um, and so we had two partners from China and um, a partner from Mali and a partner from Ghana in this project, because we just had found that there is experience there um, on in the area of uh, uh, rearing uh, fly maggots. At the end of the day. Um, so it's, it's it's another example where uh, there was there was a mutual benefit. So the, there was know-how in uh, in these countries. Um, the the Chinese institutes had been doing a lot of work. Um, they were very advanced, uh, and uh, it was really you know a, an exchange of know-how on the topic of insect rearing. And it's nice to see that the that this you know alternative protein sources, which is you know where this comes into play as well, um, is still on the EU's agenda. Now, um, the thing is, what we're talking about today is how do I get to play? You know, how do I get to join? And I'm going to do this on uh, on on an example, on a project that I'm working on right now because it it, it sort of fits, right? So, and this is about um, uh, safe transport and mobility. And here, in the call description, it says ah, cooperation is encouraged is the magic word, right? Encouraged means mandatory. And it says Japan and the United States. So in this project, I'm going to need Japanese and US partners. And I will have a possibility to fund the activities of the Japanese and uh, US partners because it's explicitly mentioned in the call text, right? Now, if I were in Japan and I had found this, uh, this specific topic, what do I do? Well. In this context, it's actually really nice because up here somewhere it um, it says 
that there are other um, you know previous projects and uh, and there's there, there's certain um, standards in it, but it's even better. Um, there's one thing that uh, I'm not super happy of because every one of these calls also has the partner search facility where I can go in and say, please take me, please take me, you know, and it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not Tinder. Okay. This is not someplace you go where there's not, uh, this is, this is, you know, I have the feeling, I mean, be your own judge, but if I go to that site for this project, what I see, okay, there's a company from Austria that has algorithms. Okay, at least it's something technical. Then there's a multimedia company that, that's that's good at doing, what, uh, I don't know, whatever. It doesn't really make sense. There's this media company which does digital marketing and communication. There's a company here that does all kinds of... The problem is that there's 27 uh, companies that have registered interest for this call topic, and 30% or 30 of them are consultants. Super, that's not what you need, right? And so if you go on that list, there's 50 consultants in you, even if you are qualified, even if you have something to show, nobody's gonna find you because everybody who looks in this, in this thing once says it's just full of consultants. Why would I go there? I don't need this function. It's been, you know, it's been killed by consultants looking for, um, looking for projects to join. So, my opinion is, unless you're going in there every day, you know, deleting your entry and copying it in again so that you're at the top of the list, it's not very useful. So what can you do? Well, one thing is you look at where does this topic, this new topic come from? In this case, some of the previous projects are actually mentioned, but every topic that the European Commission has, has a history. There was always something that's already been going on. If you look at uh, the... Um, alternative uh, uh, protein projects, there is every other year, there's, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a topic on protein, right? So what do you do? Okay, so let's say in this example, I'm just flying through this example because it's, you know, it, it's, uh, it's relevant to me right now. If I go on the, on the Informix website, I have the, the project website, I have the consortium, I can look who's in, who's in this project. At the bottom of the page, I have the contact to the project co coordinator and dissemination manager. I have people's names. I can find these people on LinkedIn. I can Google them. I can find their phone numbers. I can contact them. Um, or uh, on, sometimes on the website, it even says, you know, there, there's an interview. Again, you have a name. You'll find an organization where that person is, and then you can contact the person. But then what do you do, right? I mean, if, if you call that guy and say, I want to be in your next project, Super, a million people want to be in my next project. Who cares? What makes you special? What makes me want to have you in my new project? And I mean, at the end of the day, what do all of these projects have? They have issues. They have something that's not working well, you know, and either it's that they don't have contacts in other countries, they need help. And if you help someone in a running project, because you can't join running projects, at the end of the day. I mean, there's a couple exceptions, but 99 out of 100 times you cannot join running projects. Yeah. But if you help running projects, well, who's going to be submitting a proposal in the next round? Well, the same guys. And if you've helped them, maybe the next time they say, hey, you know what, Jen? That was really awesome. That help that you did, that webinar that you did for us, or that whatever, that blog post, whatever it is that you did. Yeah. But if they don't know you and they don't know that you deliver reliable results, they will never ask you to join. Why would they? It's a risk. There's a hundred people that want to join. There's 20 people that they know. There's three people that rock need, got recommendations and there's only one person that they need. You have to make the point that you are a valuable contribution to this project. Everybody wants free money, but not everybody can contribute significantly and substantially and reliably to a project. And as a project coordinator, as a project manager, I want reliable partners. And I'd rather have a partner who's not optimally placed, who's slightly, is only more or less on topic, that's super reliable, and then somebody who's super on topic and is unreliable, doesn't answer emails, you know, goes off, does, does, doesn't do things as, as, as planned, right? 
So it, it's a very, very tight, um, tight thing because at the end of the day, um, when you're running a project, you have very little control over, over, your, over your partners. I mean, unless that partner really screws up, you can't really you know, uh, control them. So th th there's a lot of trust and, and a lot of reliability and a lot of cooperation that, 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 that runs in these projects for them to work. And if that's not there, it's difficult. So reliability and track record of results. But obviously, if you've never played the game, you don't have a track record. So you have to offer freebies. You have to offer help. In my opinion, easiest way to get in. And it's easy to find the old players. It takes some work, but at the end of the day, you know what topic you're looking at. From that topic, you can reverse engineer what the old topics were. Every topic that's listed and that's closed at the very bottom of the, uh, uh, of the page has the approved projects. So you can, you can click on it and then you'll see the partners that are in that project. And then you know, every project has to have a website and it's usually the project's name.eu or the project's name minus project.eu, but you will you know, Google it, you'll find, the, you'll find the project website. And when you have the website, you have the people, when you have the people, you look at what they do. And when you look at what they do, you make an offer that fits and that's valuable uh, to the consortium. And then they will invite you the next time around. That's my very quick uh, uh, interpretation <laughs> and analysis of what you can do to start playing the game. That was great, Georg. I mean, thank you so much uh, for showing us that it can be done, that there have been, uh, there's a history, a really rich history of participation from Southeast uh, Asia, and we hope that uh, there will be more. And we greatly appreciate your tips and tricks so all of you here, you now know that you have to be, you have to be reliable and you have to be known as well. Uh, and uh, uh, you also have to make sure that, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that you can contribute. The contribution is, is also very clear there. So thank you so much for that. I'll bring in our other colleagues um, uh, to speak so we can have a one last round. And I just would like to give all of you the floor, maybe a few seconds. Uh, just to, if there's something that you missed as, a, as an advice uh, to, to the, actually we had about over uh, 700 registrations. So, and they will be uh, coming back to us for sure at one time or another. So if there's anything else that you'd like to add in a few seconds, um, Mikkel, we'll start with you. Well, nothing really. I, I believe that your uh, final ideas on how to, join the consortium are very useful. I personally believe that the joining a consortium preparation is the hardest part of all. Once you have been participating in one or a couple of projects, I mean, then you will have contacts, you will have collaborators, and it will be much easier to go on. Mm. Yeah, that's true. It gets easier. So just you know, put your foot in the door or a little bit, even a tiny little finger in, and then, you know, you can get your whole body inside it and be, be particularly, you know, fully contributing. So Antoine? Um, I would say don't get overwhelmed by the apparent complexity of the process. Take your time. Uh, there are a lot of resources around, get help. Um, and also for consortia, uh, for consortium building, uh, use your own contacts and uh, all the relationships that you already have at work. If you work with European institutions, uh, please get in touch with them. They will maybe be able to help you. And it's, it works a lot this way, actually. Yeah. Thank you, Antoine. And finally, Georg, you get the last word. Anything yeah. else? Any other tips? Well, I, I, I think what Antoine was saying was, uh, was really important. Don't get overwhelmed because at the end of the day, you're joining as a partner that was going to contribute one, one issue, right? And don't worry too much about, you know, what are the EU's grand goals and all that because the coordinator's worried about that anyway. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really focus on what you, what, what, you can, what you can contribute and really make that clear because a lot of times, you know, you really have to 
pull it out of people's noses what, what they can what you can contribute. You know, you'll have a project partner that's like, yeah, we have you know, we wrote a couple papers on on insects as a, as a form of feed. And then, you know, after the tenth meeting, they were like, yeah, we're actually working with a chicken farm who's been doing it for six months and you know their productivity has gone up by 10%. And they're you know they're using less antibiotics. Now you tell us, I mean, we've been writing this proposal for six months and now you tell us that the, you have these amazing results that are already, you know, that this is being used. You know, we're theorizing about it here in Europe that we might think about using, you know, insects as feed. You've been doing this for five years, bring stuff to the table, show you what, show what you can do. And, 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 you know, you know, don't be, don't be shy because, you know, if you offer 10 things, the chance that one or two of them sticks is a lot higher than if you just off, offer your top thing. Yeah, even though you think your most important contribution is that you wrote a paper in Nature, maybe your most important contribution is that your friend has a pond with fish in it and he's feeding his fish with that stuff or whatever it is. Yeah. So really look at what it is and 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 take the time to to engage with the, with the coordinators. Say what. What can you bring and and just throw ideas around? There's no such thing as a stupid idea in the brainstorming part of a project. Yeah, ninety percent of the ideas get dropped. But if you don't put it on the table, it will never be in the project. And the more you put it on the table, the more interesting you are as a potential project partner. There you go. So put it on the table. Make sure that you know uh, what you can. And even if you think that maybe very small contribution who knows that might be really the breakthrough that everybody needs in the in the consortium so thank you so much to all three of you for all three of the speakers please uh stay a few minutes i know that we're running out of time but um this is as, as we said from the very beginning this is only the first step this is actually a series and i'll give now the floor to my colleague dr susana renzo basu uh to give us the next steps and of course to close the session susana Thank you so much, Jenny. Yes, indeed. As uh, as we've heard, this is just the very first general information session. And I have to say, the speakers in this session really had the hardest job, really, to try and condense this massive program into just two hours that are somehow digestible. You've all done a wonderful job. And also, thank you to everyone who stayed with us throughout uh, the session. Uh, Jenny and I are doing our best, of course, with our colleagues from the ASEAN Secretariat to make this more digestible for you. So we'll be going from the big overview and we're looking at more uh, thematically focused sessions in the coming weeks and months. And as you can see, we have identified certain uh, thematic areas where we think there's most opportunity for you to join one of these research consortia that are funded by Horizon Europe. Uh, the next one is coming up fairly soon on the 13th of June, and we're looking at opportunities in biomedical science and health. So what we're going to do is we will be uh, trying to be as specific as possible, and we're also trying to add some practical elements. So we'll have an introduction to what the Commission is trying to do in the area of health. Um, we will then have um, some information on uh, practically, you know, we're trying to expand on that. How can you as a third country partner participate in these research consortia? Then we will, uh, we will introduce uh, a, a reasonably sh a small number of upcoming calls for proposals. So we've identified 10 calls in the area of biomedical science and health, and we will have NCP speakers, Antoine's colleagues, who will give us an introduction to each of these calls, telling us a little bit what is trying to, what are they trying to achieve, who would be perhaps an ideal candidate to apply uh, for these opportunities. And we will also meet some current um, consortia leaders. So they will, just like Georg did, tell us a little bit who are they looking for? How are they reaching out to uh, third country participants? You know, what makes a good match? So it's going to be a very um, practical session. Um, I think I had uh, already at the beginning already the QR code, but if you have questions, any feedback, anything you'd like us to perhaps include in upcoming calls, and also where can you find the registration link for this uh, next session and the upcoming sessions, it's on our website, the QR code is, is here, but you can also reach out to us at ASEAN at Euraxis.net. 
There were a lot of questions also in the chat. And as Jenny said, we don't have time to answer them now, but we have a colleague who has created a frequently asked questions guide for everything related to pillar two, which is research consortia. So we will definitely get back to you with these answers. If you have questions in half an hour, don't worry, send us an email at ASEAN at euraxis.net and we'll give you the response as well. And finally, someone asked, what can I do to prepare myself for the next sessions? What you can do is what uh, Georg, Antoine and Mikkel said, look at the CORDIS website. The CODIS website is the memory you will find all uh, research projects that have ever received funding from the European Commission. All the contact details are there, synopsis, outcomes, etc. So do a little bit of research. If you know we are looking at health and we're looking at biomedical research on the 13th of June, and this is your area of expertise, please look at the CODIS website, try to find a few uh, projects um, that have already received funding in that particular field and see whether you can already, you know, lay cable, as we say, make some connections to potential collaborators. With this, I think that's all for us for today. And I think it just leaves us with, uh, thank you very much for your time and your dedication. And we'll hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye.